uh, do not just Hey, Jesse, I'm not sure she was able to hear that because the recording yeah. message came through at the same time. Hey, Chelsea, do you want to stop screen, sh uh, screen sharing for just a second? We need to, to work out some logistic things. Okay. Um, yeah. Just one moment, folks. Sorry about that. Okay, um, we'll get the screen sharing back up. Um, while we wait for that, I'll go ahead and uh, just kind of do the welcome and introduction. So uh, for those of you that don't know me, Jessie Wilson, she, her pronouns, 1115 Waiver Strategic Operations Director. Um, and welcome to the 11th, if anyone's counting, CCO HRSN work session. Appreciate you joining us today. Uh, we did put the agenda in the chat as well as the materials, the different slide decks that um, we'll be going through as well as uh, the data sharing authorization um, attachment draft for that. So hopefully you have had a chance to take a look at that uh, document specifically. All right, looks like we're back up. Thanks, Chelsea. Do you wanna go to the next slide, please? Walk through the agenda. So for today, what we'd like to cover is uh, we'll provide you an update on the community capacity building funding um, and some good news there as well on, on, on our approval from CMS. Um, we'll spend some time reviewing that uh, data sharing authorization form that was sent to you last week. Um, and then we'll get into, uh, wait, I'm just seeing in the chat our folks. Are, are you able to see the, the screen, Deanne? Or is it just the chat? Okay. Green. Everyone's looks okay. good. I'm not sure. It looks like we're having some technical difficulties in the chat. Um, I'm gonna continue to go through the agenda and hopefully we can resolve those in just a minute. Um, we'll spend a lot of time today on the climate related supports member journey that was an attachment that was also added this morning to to the uh, outlook invite so you can take a look at that outside of this meeting as well um, and then we'll go through uh, an overview and discuss eligibility for the hrs and housing services and wrap up with some some other updates and next items great for next steps next slide please All right, well, to get us going here, let's uh, let's proceed with the community capacity building funding update. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa Croice. Lisa? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Lisa Croice, um, she, her pronouns. I'm the 1115 um, policy advisor. Uh, I will say, I think we resolved it in the chat. I hope so, but um, if you continue to have issues, let us know because it's a really useful tool for these work sessions to get your feedback. So just want to circle back to that housekeeping before we move on. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, and, and um, a really big milestone that we hit at the end of the year um, that Jesse just referred to was the approval um, from CMF of the HRSN infrastructure protocol. Um, as you all may remember, um, infrastructure is what CMS refers to what we call community capacity building funds. And so that was a really big milestone and really well-timed. Um, beginning of January, as you can see on our timeline, we launched um, the 
CCBF grant program. Um, so we received um, those signed agreements from all CCOs at this point. And so we are um, in this first phase of the CCBF grant program, which is really exciting. Um, we'll go ahead and go to the end. You know, you all have seen this timeline. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. I want to get to the next slide and talk about the next steps and how can support all of you in this. Thank you, Tulsi. Um, so we do have our um, OHA CCBF website up. Um, this is a, a portal both for um, partners as well as CCOs. Um, on, the, on that website, you'll find the actual infrastructure protocol that was approved. Um, we are adding all of the CCO point of contacts for um, CBO partners to have access to, as well as your webpage links. And so that is on there. Um, a reminder, you'll be getting an email from me um, later this morning um, to remind you to send that to us. We do need a point of contact and your webpage link um, to add to the website. We have some, but not all at this point. Um, once we, so later in the, in the year, once we have awards approved, um, we will add a list of all of those community partners that received funding. Um, that is a request um, from you all in a previous session. We are developing a CCO CCBF toolkit. Um, some of this is uh, feedback from our ses sessions with all of you on what would be helpful. Um, we are really interested in hearing from you all if there are other things that would be helpful besides what we have listed here. Um, we have a two-page um, CCBF summary um, that is on the website and will be translated in multiple languages. Um, they'll have customizable CCBF flyers. <clears throat> and we're developing FAQs for a variety of audiences, including CCOs. So we're getting quite a few questions um, from you all about this program, and we are developing that into a FAQ that will um, be updating ongoing and have as a resource for you um, as you know, we continue in this work. So if there are other resources that you all um, would find helpful, please, please let us know. Um, we are definitely looking at, thank you Amy, for putting the website in the chat. <clears throat> we are definitely looking at how to support you um, and wanting to make sure that communication is very clear with um, community partners and that they're reaching out to you for the specific processes and information that you all wanna share and, uh, as they navigate through this program. Um, the next slide. Yeah, the ETA for the toolkit is really by the end of the month. We're really hoping to have um, this all as soon as possible. Um, so here's some of the communications products um, after this quarter. So really everything I just went through, um, our goal is to have them up by the end of the month. I think the translated documents would be um, by the 26th. Let me look at the chat. That, these are the last of the slides. I'll let you all review this information. I just want to check in the chat and see if there's other questions that I didn't address. Yeah. Okay. So that's been dropped. Okay. So that is all I have on CCBF. I'm happy to answer any questions. Please reach out to me with any questions um, as you all uh, move forward in this work. We are definitely here to support you. Um, so thanks, everyone. Looks like Kayla has a question. Yeah, translated versions of the application. Um, so we we had actually discussed this, um, and I would love to hear from more CCOs. If if that is useful, we can provide that. Um, we were unclear of the capacity for each CCO to be able to review a tra uh, an application in Spanish, but we can we can provide that. Jesse, do you want to move us forward to the next agenda topic? Absolutely. Next slide, please. And thanks, Lisa. Lisa, sorry, this is Kayla. I have a quick question. Sure. Um, so for for the organizations that will be getting some of this community funding, 
Um, can you confirm if they have to be DMAP enrolled prior to receiving the funding at all? Um, providers, you know, as, as part of like the, the climate, housing, whatever, in terms of encounters had to be DMAP enrolled and that came up in the all plan system technical, but I just wanted to confirm if the upfront funding to build like infrastructure, technology, whatever, that these providers do not have to be DMAP enrolled prior to funding going out. They do not. Okay. Um, what they need is the intent to be an HRSN service provider. Mm -hmm. And really what we want to encourage everyone um, to use these funds is to help develop the capacity to meet some of these requirements that are coming, right? So we want them, they shouldn't be, you know, at a state of readiness. Um, this should help them get to that state of readiness. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to confirm. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Thanks, Kayla. All right, we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next topic, which is the data sharing authorization form. And we have Dr. Carey with us uh, to walk us through these slides and lead the discussion. Good morning, everyone. Can everybody hear me all right? Yep. Great. Um, well, I all right, the next six slides are about our data sharing authorization form and the interpretation around HIPAA for HRSN service providers. Next slide, please. Thank you all um, for your patience. I know we've started talking about this in the fall and we are looking forward to the, the discussion today. <clears throat> the Department of Justice has interpreted for us that HRSN service providers are not HIPAA covered entities and thus do not need to be treated as business associates. This uh, interpretation uh, follows a lot of careful inquiry into the HIPAA rules and consideration about this. We know um, the gravity of this decision. And this interpretation is informed through the Office of Civil Rights um, recent gu guidance that they've put out that was recently reviewed in 2023, as well as a 2021 proposed CSR both of which indicate that HRSM service providers may be treated differently from healthcare providers under HIPAA. Next slide. And so the mechanism, given that obviously health plan CCOs are HIPAA covered entities and HSRN service providers are not HIPAA covered entities per our interpretation, the mechanism for sharing the information between those two entities is a data sharing authorization form. The HIPAA, HIPAA and HIPAA rule permits an individual to provide written authorization for the use and disclosure of their PHI. Federal guidance sets forth the minimum criteria for the contents of those authorization forms. The DSAF or the data sharing authorization form tracks these criteria. These criteria include limiting PHI to the minimum and only for the stated purposes, i.e. HRSN service authorization, closed loop referrals, and participation in person-centered service planning or informing the person-centered service plan as is relevant and appropriate. This DSAF also allows the bi-directional information sharing between the CCO and the HRSN service provider to really facilitate the collaboration necessary for the person-centered service planning and ensuring that the services are meeting the member's health needs. In addition to the DSAF, and if CCOs choose to um, use a DSAF, CCOs should consider establishing data security measures for their HRSN service providers that account for the sensitivity of the information being shared. And I will say explicitly that we uh, hope that you all will consider using the DSAF um, and not considering HRSN service providers as HIPAA covered entities. Uh, in order to support uniformity across the network around expectations, but we very much appreciate um, that you all will be talking with your legal counsel about that. Next slide. Eligibility and receipt of, DH of HRSN services cannot be contingent upon an OHP member authorizing their data sharing. So they need not sign the DSAF in order to be determined eligible or necessarily to receive their HRSN services. However, not signing the DSAF 
may make more challenging the connection to HRSM services, and I'll talk through that in the next slide. If the DSAF is used, CCOs have the responsibility to verify whether the information sharing has been authorized by their members prior to referral to HRSN service provider. So essentially, uh, CCOs, if they choose to use this route or if they interpret the rule in the same way, um, it will be your responsibility to track and manage the DSAF form and uh, OHA will not request copies of this form from you. Our question uh, around this is for those of you who choose to use this, how can we best support you in tracking and managing the form? Next slide. And Meg, there's a couple of comments or questions in the chat. I saw that. I'm going to get through all of these first, and then um, and then we'll discuss some of these. Thank yeah. you for tracking those. Um, I see that 42 um, CFR 42 Part, part Two SUD related um, is is listed, and and we'll get to some of that. So this is a little bit of a of a flow shot sheet, a flow diagram of um, of uh, the algorithm. HRSN connectors may offer members the DSAF as they are making the initial request for HRSN services. Um, so that may be a place where um, members may first, be, uh, may first be offered this form. Um, however, once the CCO determines whether a member is eligible for HRSN services, then the CCOs must verify the completion of a DSAF or if it has not already been done, offer the member the DSAF form. If the member agrees to sign the DSAF form, then direct referral can be placed to the HRSN service provider because again, the DSAF form um, authorizes the sharing of that PHI between, or really the, the um, PII, personal ident uh, identifying information as we're wanting to limit the PHI. Um, can authorize the sharing of that form with the service provider. If the member opts not to sign the DSAF, then the CCO will provide the individual with notice of their HRSN service authorization and the contact information for the appropriate HRSN service providers that the member can go to. And then it will be incumbent upon the member to refer themselves and connect to those HRSN service providers. Because information cannot be shared, uh, we would not expect the HRSN service providers to contribute meaningfully to the person-centered service plan. However, because HRSN service providers are not HIPAA-covered entities per our interpretation, they are actually able to share PHI and member-specific information back to the CCO. It is just that the CCO, the covered entity, can't share information out to the service providers. So for the purpose of invoicing, HRSN service providers can include, without the DSAF being signed, minimum necessary, minimum necessary information to invoice and send those invoices back to the CCO. Now, we know that um, many of your HRS providers will be HRSN providers and may, and um, probably a handful at least of the HRSN service providers will be business associates. If they are business associates, they can share member PHI through that business associate agreement regardless of whether the DSAF is signed. Next slide. The next slides walk through the required elements. These again, the federally required elements of the DSAF. So this is um, the current draft form, but it gives you an idea of the first page and you have, you have um, access to the entire draft. And so again, the DSAF authorizes sharing information only for HRSN services. And that's one of the requirements to specify what services the information can be shared in regards to. So this is only authorizing information sharing as is pertinent for the HRSN program. Next slide. Part two um, is delineates the information authorized to be shared as we 
discussed up above, minimum information is authorized to be shared. Uh, we are determining if housing status information can be disclosed without authorization. Um, if it cannot be, then there will be a um, description that housing status information may be shared through this form. Um, we have limited the kind of information that will be shared and knowing 42, um, uh, knowing CFR 42 part two, um, there is a particular paragraph as you will see on the form that addresses SUD, substance use disorder related information and the information contained within 42 part two. Part three outlines the sources and recipients of the information and the constraints around that. Part four discusses the expiration, revocation, and changes to the form, which is allowable. And so if used, if CCOs choose to use a DSAF, they will have the responsibility to maintain the signed form and facilitate any member requested changes to that form. Uh, currently, the um, form is valid for one year. Part five um, is the rights, and one of the rights that members are, are uh, obligated for is obtaining a list of care partners to whom their information has been shared. And so, uh, the CCOs, if they use this, the state, as I said, we are using this, um, will need a mechanism for being able to tell members, uh, the HRS and service pro providers who have received their information. Part six is information that may be shared without consent in accordance with federal law on this. And then we have attachments. We will be including an FAQ and we will be delighted to share our FAQ with you all for those of you who are using this. One of our questions is whether or not we should include a list of all potential HRS and service providers in that list of attachments um, and, and or their contact information or if that would be uh, both cumbersome and or um, potentially confusing as members will be referred to specific HRS and service providers as appropriate for the services that they've been authorized for. So that is another question for you all. That should be the end of my slides on, um, on this section. And now I'm delighted to ask, answer some questions. As I mentioned, you can look um, through part two of the attached form to see the language around 42 part two. Um, there is question about this form doesn't meet requirements for an ROI. That is correct. This form is not an ROI. And that, uh, I appreciate you raising that because that's a very um, important distinction. Anne, do you wanna speak a little bit more about that concern? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that was Deanne's comment or mine, but so my concern is, so the interpretation is these folks are not part of HIPAA or CFR 42 part two, yet the form indicates that they're dealing with HIPAA and CFR 42 part two information and almost appears as if that form would allow disclosure of that information. Um, and so that's my concern is you have a form that touches HIPAA and CFR 42 part two, even though this is being interpreted as not part of CFR 42 part two. And there's nothing in that form that would allow us to release that information because it's not compliant. So would you go back to, um, let me see, I don't remember what number it is, maybe eight or nine, slide eight or nine, Chelsea. So, uh, a couple more back. Uh, two more back. There you go, this one, perfect. Um, so, HIPAA rule allows individuals to authorize the use and disclosure of their PHI to non-HIPAA covered entities. Um, that's why this is not an ROI, that's why this is not consent, but a very particular authorization form that 
allows for the authorization of HIPAA covered entities to share minimum information, minimum PHI to non HIPAA covered entities. Right, that's, my, that's not my concern. My concern is you're mixing HIPAA okay. and CFR 42 part two in the same form when, this, when you're saying that the, these folks are not covered under HIPAA or CFR 42 part two. My, I guess my overall concern, maybe I'm not saying this right, my overall concern is we're mixing various laws into a form that's not intended to cover those laws and it's not done in a way that would cover those laws. I just, my concern is this full conform is gonna be more confusing than not having a form. If we don't need a form, if you're saying they're not covered by HIPAA and they can share information outside of a form, then making a form almost makes it look like it is HIPAA and CFR 42 part two. Do you understand what I'm saying? We've made I, I, maybe let, let me let me try to to say this um, and I appreciate your patience as um, as you're trying to get me up to speed with what you're saying. HIPAA covered entities cannot share PHI to non-HIPAA covered entities outside of this authorization form. So CCOs upon approving a member for an HRSS, HRSN service cannot disclose that referral to HRSN service providers directly without a signed authorization form. However, this form doesn't meet the requirements of HIPAA. No, because this is a form that under HIPAA law, there is the um, provision for this authorization. So this is saying, how can you, um, what, are the, what are the provisions for sharing information between a HIPAA covered entity and a non-HIPAA covered entity? And what the Office of Civil, Civil Rights and this um, proposed CFR related to HIPAA is for the purpose of HRSN. So this is specifically to address this issue that is raised by this brand new Medicaid benefit of HRSN. For the purpose of HRSN, HRSN providers can be seen as a special kind of social service provider for whom it is appropriate to share information for the provision of these services in the condition that this authorization form is signed. This is the method through which North Carolina, which has implemented some of these benefits before us, has used. Am I so, getting closer to answering? Well, so as a, person, as a compliance person, I have to say that I think if there's a major breach and, and OCR Office of Civil Rights comes rolling in, I don't know that they're going to view this the same way. And yeah, I, I appreciate that. And this, you know, and, and this is, um, this was an interpretation that um, has has gone through a lot of thoughtfulness, of careful thoughtfulness, of consultation, um, and you know it, it is a judgment call. And um, our Department of Justice thinks it's reasonable to interpret the rule this way. They think that there is guidance from OCR suggesting that this is an appropriate interpretation, as well as guidance from the 2021 proposed CFR to this. Um, is there any and to your point about if there's a major breach, the so the the data sharing authorization form will permit the sh the authorizing well will authorize the sharing of information. And then the other piece of this is we have to use minimum information. And what other ways can we protect data so that if a breach happens, it is really essentially PAI, PII and not PHI that is shared. And so that it will not be a significantly impactful breach. And so things like HRSN service providers don't need to know the diagnosis of individuals uh, that, that makes them eligible for the service. That's not relevant to providing any of these HRSN services. Um, and so, taking great care to provide the minimal information, and then also establishing data security measures around um, 
limiting and using encryption when possible during any email or electronic communication, minimum inform information, et cetera. So the, the diagnosis though is not necessary. And, and I um, appreciate that y'all would like to see the DOJ's opinion on this. And um, we are working on, um, we are working on some communications around that. But, but wanted to make sure that we were discussing this with you all up front because um, I am totally appreciating all of the all of the questions and concerns that this is raising. And um, I believe that Ellen is on. And Ellen, as you know, I always welcome you to speak up on this. You want to jump in now? Because this was, and I, you know, I just want to acknowledge that this was not a decision um, taken lightly, and there was a lot of of consideration through. Um, this decision and 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 I see a, a request for a focused discussion with compliance officers it's a great idea and I would um, I would certainly welcome that Jesse I don't know if there's any more um, conversations in the chat before we go to Jacob's comment let's go to Jacob Thanks, Meg. I appreciate the discussion on this. I think that um focused discussion plan is a, a good one. The, you you mentioned that um there, uh, you know, there's going to be other restrictions we want to put on the HRSM providers around make ensuring they're, you know, following minimum necessary, ensuring they have the security requirement systems set up the way we want them, um, and then you know there'll be other things. What um when and where and how they can further share data was another whole set of things. Those are all things that are um, spelled out in the BAA. So why did we move past just having a BAA with these organizations? Isn't that why we have BAAs? We can, we're a covered entity. We're going to share PHI. And um, yeah, no, I, t I totally appreciate that. Right. And, and I think, you know, really explicitly, um, HIPAA and BAA expectations around data security is ideal in many ways. And we would like our HRSM service providers to be able to get to that level of data protection and data security for the well-being of, of our members and this potentially, you know, quite sensitive information. So the goal is really to get to the point. The reason that we didn't just have them be a BAA is because um, we can't choose whether people are HIPAA covered or not. It is whether they are subject to being HIPAA covered entities per the federal rule. And so the first question is, are HRSN service providers HIPAA covered entities? Yes or no. And through reading the rule, the OCR guidance, this new proposed um, 2021 rule is we're interpreting that as that they're not HIPAA covered entities. Hmm. So you're saying BAs are only between two entities that are could uh, that are potential covered entities? I don't. Ellen, can you speak to that? You're able to unmute. Yeah, I know she was having trouble unmuting. Yeah. Okay. Well. Yeah, I've, and I just you know, you've certainly given us plenty so, to think about here. Yeah, so that so that and I am asking this is um, you know as a as a as a <laughs> someone who always works in HIPAA covered entities I am well habituated to following HIPAA and so I'm not an expert in all of the the nuances around BAAs but my um, my understanding is that BAAs are essentially for organizations that are expected to be HIPAA compliant. 
Um, but others on this call will, will certainly be able to speak to that. I think the conversation with the compliance officers, like I mentioned, thank you for raising that. That seems just absolutely reasonable and really informative for all of us. So um, I would certainly welcome that and we can work to get that scheduled. Um, there is a comment, um, Chanel, from you uh, um, that is exactly correct, that the consent is a different process than the authorization, which is one of the reasons that we're being really specific about calling this an authorization form. Um, and it's different from the ROI. And so this is the provision within HIPAA that for these services that allows the sharing of minimum and only for particular purposes, um, member PHI. And, and Jeff, just to comment to your to your point is that if we were sharing PHI, we would expect them to be HIPAA compliant. Um, but the you know the the interpretation is that they're not HIPAA covered entities. The goal is to get is to get to a point where their data protection is um, you know maybe someday in the future that they are HIPAA compliant um, just because the standards for HIPAA compliance are are um are ideal in some senses um but but that we recognize also not all hrsn service providers will be able to be hipaa compliant but this is something to think about um, with ccbf funding as well and how can ccbf funding be used to really shore up data security data protection measures it seems that the chat has quieted down i very much uh, recognize that does not mean your questions and concerns have quieted down, um, but that we just need to have more conversation. Y'all need to consider this more. Um, and um, that, um, I don't know, Jesse, if there's anything else in the chat that um, that is worth addressing right now or whether we should she move on and, and schedule that meeting with the compliance officers. Yeah, I think um, it would be best to schedule, I mean, especially where we are with the agenda. Um, I think it's a great idea to follow follow up with that meeting with the compliance officer. So thank you for that. Um, just acknowledging that it will take a little bit of time to get that scheduled. And it's reasonable to say that this form may not be a final form shared with the final version of the HRSN guidance document slated to go out next week. Uh, so there may be some different timelines here so we can have more thoughtful discussions um, on this form as needed. But we will take that down as an action item to get uh, that meeting scheduled. So um, we can bring these questions, any questions that have been put in the chat and voiced here into that conversation. So thanks folks. And Jesse, I just want to add here too. I think um, you know we're doing our best as a state to balance what we're hearing in terms of what we absolutely need in terms of our compliance with the um, reality of needing our CBO partners to be willing to engage without a high level of burden. And so we really are looking for minimum necessary. Um, ways in which we can foster and support those partnerships and really limit information sharing, you know, one direction, that type of um, process. So we appreciate that there is pushback here. It's why we're coming to you. It's why we're having work sessions. Um, and so we'll continue to have those to get to a space where we can have some mutual agreement on the best path forward for us to be able to actually Keep information safe, absolutely a priority of our agency, while also um, ensuring that we have a lot of partners who can engage in this work with you all. So compliance meeting sounds great. We always welcome feedback. This is meant to be a discussion. Thank you for your input. All right. Chelsea, let's go ahead and move to the next slide, please. Um, and so at this point, we're going to actually uh, bring up some different slides and we'll have our partners from Deloitte share their, their screen. 
as we walk through a member journey document um, that we have started to draft and looking for um, your input on and looking to identify any gaps um, or barriers in, in this uh, sort of this member journey here that we've drafted. So it uh, looks like we have that up right now. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Amelia Reynolds and Lily Bork from Deloitte. Great, thank you so much, Jesse. Um, my name is Lily Bork, I used to see her pronouns and um, as Jesse mentioned, I'm a contractor currently supporting the development of the HRSM member and provider journey maps. Amelia, anything you wanna cover before I dive in? No, I think uh, I just want to say, you know, share my gratitude to Lily and the team that's been helping create these member journeys. We've been doing a lot of the design process. Um, and the goal here was really to make this information laid out in a way that is a little bit more simple to understand. Um, so we kind of want to check some of that work and then make sure that we're capturing what the member can experience um, once they have that service authorization from you all and of what their experience is going to look like and actually receiving the device. Um, we met with you all one-on-one -on -one to kind of hear about how HRS goes, but we want to make sure that we're incorporating um, those elements and that we've captured it correctly so we can make sure that the members can navigate this process effectively. So really, again, just thank you to Lily um, for putting these together, and we'll see if we can answer questions along the way. Great. Thank you, Amelia. Um, so yeah, as Neely mentioned, we've been uh, meeting with internal OHA staff who are leading the HRSO work to really capture the information for building the member and provider journey tools. Um, and we're just really excited to preview the member journey tool today um, and to gather any feedback or questions you might have to continue to help us get this tool right. Um, so for the member journey, we wanted to think about what information members need, the actions they need to take um, and help they can get for, for them to receive the benefits and how we can communicate those things in plain language. Uh, here we have the table of contents to give you or members a uh, quick glance of what's available um, in the member journey and how to navigate this tool. Uh, as you can see, we're kicking off with an overview of the HRS and benefits and who are all the key partners and uh, organizations involved in providing HRS and benefits to members. And then we have information around eligibility before we dive into uh, the steps members have to take to apply, uh, qualify and receive HRSM benefits. We then wrap up um, the journey with some helpful links and um, important resources. Um, now for a deeper dive, here is the overview page where members can learn about uh, the different types of benefits under HRSN. Um, and some tips on how to use and navigate this document so, so they know what this tool is for, um, which is to help them understand how to apply, receive, and maintain HRSM benefits. Um, we then go into the different organizations and people that play a role in ensuring eligi uh, eligible members can receive these new benefits. Uh, we've included uh, the people who are eligible, um, and we'll go into more detail about eligibility shortly. Uh, but we also have CCO and fee-for-service providers, community connectors, um, and vendors and service providers who will deliver the device or services to members. Um, if there are other major players we should include, please um, let us know. And I'll just pause for just a quick moment to see if we have any um, questions so far, or feedback of, um, especially for this who is involved page. Great, I don't think I see any hands raised or anything in the comments, I'll continue. But again, if you um, start to have feedback or questions, feel free to drop them in the chat and I'll make sure to, to pause um, as we go through this uh, member journey. Great. 
So these um, next few slides are dedicated to eligibility where members can go through each, um, each eligibility category and see if they're eligible for these new benefits. We have this landing page um, type of slide where members can click on each tab at the top to learn more about um, uh, eligible groups, uh, require risk fa factors and um, service related needs. We also hope with the plus, the plus signs uh, between each category box that it's clear that um, OHP members must meet all three criteria. Um, and then I'll just quickly go through the next few slides for you to see uh, what we have on each page. This one is about the eligible groups or covered population. The next is about um, the risk factors. <clears throat> and then we have um, service related needs for the last slide on eligibility. Any questions so far? And check the chat. Great, thank you for the feedback. Alrighty. Um, so after eligibility, we have this member steps at um, a glance. Overall, we have five major paths that members will take for this journey. Uh, from learning about the options and choosing to participate to complete screening and eligibility paperwork and then receiving decisions on their HR HRSM benefit um, and then to receiving services. And for this particular um, path, uh, we will see grant drops depending on the type of service the member is looking for or qualified to receive. Um, and this is where we will see um, differences in how to receive a device from climate services versus uh, receiving housing support, for example. And we currently have information built out for climate and then we'll work on housing and nutrition benefits once um, things are more fleshed out. And then last but not least, uh, members can create a care plan and get help if they have issues or questions with their services or equipment. So that is just a quick glance at all the major steps that members will be taking on this journey. Um, and then after that landing page slide for steps where, um, sorry, this is um, a landing page slide for the steps where members can start to click on the tabs to learn more. Um, so for example, we have learn about options and get started as the first step and then I will go ahead and go to that step right now. Um, here we list out the ways um, a member can learn about HRSN services and how to confirm if they are already an OHP member or may qualify. Um, and then throughout the document, starting with this slide, you'll see self-advocacy tips that members can keep in mind when navigating through the HRSN benefit process. And I'm going to pause again now to see if folks have any questions. Trevor, please go ahead. Then Robin has her hand up. I'm so sorry, <laughs> Robin. Hi, this is Robin from UHA. I was wondering if step five there, mm -hmm. that care plan should be earlier on, like around, you know, with step three. Um, it seems like you would kind of, you know, when working with care coordination, that's when that service plan, the um, person-centered service plan would be, you know, generated and that would help then, you know, with the furnishing of this benefit as well as other needs that are not addressed. Is there some rationale of why that would come later? That's a great, oh, sorry, go ahead. So. Yeah, Robin, I think that does make sense. Um, and it doesn't have to be uh, exclusive to a fifth step. I think what we want to avoid is that we are um, required, we don't wanna require that that person-centered service plan be completed in order for services to be authorized and delivered to the individual. But I think it absolutely can, can take place at a different step. 
um, as long as it is not um, being you know, the the contingency to to authorizing and and delivering services. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I guess my then to my follow up question would be then would CCOs so say that you know a member did not want to engage with our care coordination and you know answer questions to create this person centered service plan if they did not want to participate in that then are and we didn't that therefore have a you know care plan for them um, are we. Like, are we required to have a care plan for everyone that receives these services, I guess? And if we do not, if the member does not want to participate and generate that, are we okay to furnish these services and, and get, you know, um, funding for that service for that member? Yeah, so the requirement is for everyone who um, is eligible and receives HRSN services that they should also have the person-centered service plan. However, we've included language that they can decline that. And so if they decline to participate in the person-centered service plan um, process, yes, that's that's fine. Just make a note of that. The CCO would need to make it uh, document that, um, but they can still participate, receive the services, and CCO can still uh, receive payment for those services. Okay, great. So workflow-wise, we can have the determination, the service you know, provided or furnished, you know, in step four, and then we can have care coordination, you know, follow up and try to outreach. I'm guessing that most members won't decline, they just won't respond. And so if we document our attempts to outreach to them, then we are covered essentially. Yep. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Great question. And Robin, that sounds like something we can also include in the provider CCO open car journey, if that's helpful. Um, but thank you so much for, for flagging this. And I'm just checking the chat. Okay. Any other feedback or questions so far? Okay, great, thank you. Um, so for the next step, we have complete screening and eligibility forms where members can learn to complete the screening process with their care coordinator or what the referral process might look like, um, what forms might they need to complete or have ready. Um, and as a self advocate tip, we noted that members should have documents ready for um, their CCO or fee for service provider so they can um, verify eligibility quicker and easier. Any questions or flags so far? I have a quick question. Um, yes. And I was going to put it in the chat and I was messing that up um, regarding these uh, these attempts to perform these steps. Uh, do we have any guidance around number and type of attempts and how long to turn these steps around? We're getting questions like that from our operations staff. Thank you. Is the question about, for example, how long maybe a CCO or open card provider might take to turn things around for the member or? Correct. Uh, Correct. Yeah. Job. I think for the next slide, we have something. So, for example, um, for here, when we talk about received decisions from a care coordinator, we have within 14 days of completing my screening and submitting my forms. So we're hoping that in areas where we do have time frames, we've included them so that members can have a better idea of um, turnaround time. Okay, that'll help. Great, thank you. Are those turnaround times in the guidance document also? It, it should be, I, I believe our team, yes. sorry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, and if, um the requests are submitted without documentation is there a different turnaround time or a number like you know with a prior authorization you have to do three attempts and two methods is that reflected in this hrsn process as well that 
that I am not sure if I saw anything in the Lindsay, can you repeat the question? Sorry, I was trying to navigate sure. to this document. Sure. I guess it's a two-part question. So one, if if um, we receive their request and there is not supporting documentation, um, is that time frame extended? And or um, do we have to, or is there regulation for turnaround times like with a prior authorization where we have to do three attempts and two methods within that 14 days? Or is there language around what happens to get that supporting documentation? Yeah, so we haven't put any time frames specific to um, from the time that you receive that initial request from from the HRSN connector um, to obtaining maybe all the information that you would need um, to, to confirm eligibility. Um, really, the the language that we've included is. reasonable efforts and with a reasonable within a reasonable period of time um, to verify that information <laughs> because we know that there may be um, you know some back and forth there and, and, and checking for different pieces of information that you may need to obtain. Does that answer your question? So I think so. And so what that 14 days is um, basically like first, you'll make first contact within 14 days. Is that how I'm interpreting that? Let me pull up the exact language so I don't misspeak here. Let me okay. this document. Sorry, I don't mean to diverge, but. It's okay. <laughs> Jesse, this is Amelia. I think this might be one that we might need to edit this page. Um, okay. I think the only time requirement that we have that right now is currently tied to 14 days is that once an eligibility determination is made, the service authorization must follow within 14 calendar days. That's um, right. So I think we've not been overly prescriptive on what the attempts or timeline looks prior to the eligibility determination. Um, I think some of the, the reasoning behind that was that, you know, folks that fall into these transition populations are going to be some of um, our members that are a little bit harder to reach and might require a little bit more um, care coordination and not wanting to limit their access to this by not being able to reach them in a 14 day period. So I think this is this is something that is handled in guidance, um, which means I think we can continue the discussion on it, especially as we're moving into some of the other services. But as it sits right now, the only thing that is specified in, in contract is that um, the service authorization must follow within 14 calendar days of the eligibility determination. That's right. Thanks, Amelia. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and since we're um, on this slide now, uh, so this is where for step three, and again, thank <laughs> you to everyone for your feedback. We'll be sure to um, edit this page accordingly, but um, this is where members will um, learn about their decisions um, and uh, what happens next, including what they can do if they receive a denial letter we listed the appeal process and also called out the HRS program. Um, and we also remind members um, to update their contact information so they can receive their letter in the mail. And I'm just checking chat. Great, any other question or feedback? before we go to the next step. Great, thank you. And so this next section is where members can learn about uh, receiving the three different types of HRSN benefits. Members can use this uh, landing page slide to click on the different uh, tabs to learn more about each benefit type. 
right now we only have information for climate services. So I will jump to that page now for us to focus on. Since climate services are focused on delivery and installation, we include um, information about scheduling the delivery and follow-ups. And we've left um, this blank for now, but once we know the detail about how members can request installation support, we'll be updating this um, journey tool accordingly. Um, and as a self-advocacy tip, we've included a link to the tenant's rights document for installing portable ACs. And I will pause there to see if um, folks have any reaction, feedback, questions. And as we have uh, more information for housing and nutrition, we will be populating um, this page as well as this one. But for now, we just have placeholders <clears throat> for um, telling members that information will be coming soon. On the previous screen, you had kind of the, um, they were receiving their device, confirmed they received their equipment. Is there anything like if that CBO partner goes there, I'm just going to use a space heater as an example, and it's not safe, either the person doesn't seem like maybe they can safely use it or the home doesn't seem like that would be a place the CBO can can say maybe this isn't a good place to install it. And how would we document that for that? What happens in those situations? I think this is Amelia. I don't know um, if Josh Tom if Josh Thompson is on. Um, if he has any experience with our um, state program of of CBOs that have helped with uh, getting devices to folks or what their living um, situation might be as far as safe use goes. Hey, can you hear me? There we go, yeah. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Josh Thompson, he, him pronouns. Uh, could you reframe the question one more time for me, Amelia, so I make sure I answer accurately? Yeah, so the question was, let's say that a community-based organization is going to an individual's home to assist with setting up the device and realize that in that environment, they don't feel like um, the member has, um, like can safely utilize the device. So we do have built in, so I'm gonna, that's the question. <laughs> I'm gonna say part of it of, uh, I know that we have in part of our process that we do, you know, intend to have the member essentially like, say like, yes, I can safely use this device. So I think the question is like, if the member has said, yes, I can safely use and install this device, but then somebody arrives and determines that no, in fact, it's not able to be safely utilized. Um, what might that process look like? Of how is how do we document that? Um, how do we like, is that something that the community-based organization or um, the vendor might be able to report back to the CCO or um, TPC? Gotcha. Um... Yes, in those instances, if somebody was assisting with an installation for an AC and they felt that the um, electricity options were not adequate. Um, so in the state program, we didn't run into uh, a whole lot of issues where it was around makeshift housing or um, illegally zoned housing or any instances like that, the, a lot of the concerns came for um, the amount of amperage it might charge on an older system. Um, surge protectors was something that we found to be a um, mediary uh, insurance for anybody who resided in a building um, or residence anywhere that was um, older or dated, or they were worried that the electrical, um, you know, may not be as strong as some of the more modern systems. Uh, we did not encounter any where 
um, there was a <laughs> delivery to a residence where, um, you know, there was a fear just off initial assessment of utilizing the device that it may cause uh, like a fire or something like that. I think in those instances, it would really be more upon the relationship between the CCO and the organization doing the installation or the home visit. Um, they should have some kind of communication with either a case manager who uh, assisted with the request. Um, I think at that time they would want to reach back out to the CCO um, to either revalidate the uh, safe utilization attestation or offer some kind of um, mediary assurances such as surge protectors or something like that. Um, that might not be the most precise answer that would be helpful, but um, just based off my past experience and, and knowing how a lot of the CBO organizations work, um, that would kind of be my anticipation on how that process might look. Thank you, Josh. This is Amelia, I'll go back. Um, or I just had a hand come up. Well, I'll answer this question first and then we'll go to you. Um, a question pop up about the vendor calling in advance. Um, I think this might be another area where we can refine this a little bit. Um, I, you're right, I don't think the vendor will be the one that will be calling and coordinating delivery. Um, our, I think what we need to better capture is that when we are meeting with you all about how HRS services are delivered, um, if it is just ordering, say, an air conditioner online and having it shipped to the member's home, that there's a process built in there to confirm with the member that, you know, like, is this your current address? Um, knowing that sometimes the information that's in the system has either not been updated or um, maybe someone is using a PO box or something like that um, and need a confirmed delivery address to actually receive the device, that that's where that coordination would likely sit with the care coordination team, um, not with the vendor. So I've uh, flagged that in our notes uh, for an edit. So thank you for asking that question, that question so we could get that uh, refined a bit. Laura, go ahead. I saw your hand come up. Thanks. I just had a quick question about the bottom of the flyer around the self-advocacy. Um, will there be, this sounds redundant, but will there be guidance in the guidance document <clears throat> around communication with the landlords if because I my fear is that okay well we have a member that's going to um, advocate for their rights and the landlord's going to say well I you know prove this or show me where we have to do this I mean installing these in a rented apartment or a rented house I could just see there might be a little um, there might be a little pushback from the landlords so I'm just wondering you know, we we can absolutely advocate, but how do we handle that when the landlords come back and say, you're not gonna install that in, in this apartment? Jesse, I can jump back in. Um, Thank you. I'll lower my hand and answer that one first. Um, so in the... In the legal letter that we provided from the state program originally, um, the issue that landlords had were in relation to window mounted cooling devices. So the um, air conditioners that actually sat mounted in a window frame often needed uh, exterior bracing and then also had a drain hose that would uh, usually vent out a window. <laughs> Uh, we purchased portable cooling devices that do not require an external drain. Uh, they also do not require any modification to a home or rental unit. Um, it simply requires a um, sliding window. You open the sliding window, you know, six or eight inches, and then you insert this panel uh, that's connected to the uh, rear of the device. And it's just a basically a vent panel that fits in a window frame. So um, we put out the legal letter so that landlords knew that one, these devices were not window mounted units that would modify uh, any type of residential structure or uh, electrical system. 
Um, and two, that we wanted to clarify because there were some Oregon uh, laws in the Portland metro area, at least that I know about, that uh, prevented uh, secondary floor or above um, apartment complexes and, and housing units to have these window, window mounted units. Um, so we wanted to clarify to anyone that received a device that these were uh, not prohibited devices, that there was no restrictions for them utilizing them in the residence. And then if they did um, receive any type of pushback from um, housing authorities that were unclear about, um, you know, maybe they heard that they were getting some kind of AC unit and to their understanding that included some kind of window mounted unit that would modify the structure. Um, not being the case, they would be still prohibited to the thought of that. So we were just trying to clarify some of those terms and um, statutes that Oregon had and that these devices are not prohibited in any way and they cannot be prohibited for use in a building, um, at least to my knowledge. Uh, I did wanna add one more um, piece of context to the previous question about the um, coordination of delivery, especially in conjunction with somebody that requests uh, installation supports. Um, so in the past, we utilized direct shipping, but we also had bulk deliveries to CBOs. CBOs that we partnered with uh, for installation assistance, we arranged to have devices um, either direct shipped or included in those bulk distributions so that um, the organization that was doing the installation could reach out and coordinate um, an appropriate time to meet the resident. Uh, it prevented us from having to ensure that the Amazon, you know, a, an online purchase showed up on the delivery date and that the homeowner was there to receive it. And then they also would have to coordinate with somebody showing up for uh, installation support, which uh, I always like to be clear and just reiterate installation support for these AC portable units is not an installation in the sense that it requires tools or anything like that. It, it is more of a unboxing and assembly, um, which the major demographics that are impacted by extreme heat and cold uh, are the elderly, obviously. Uh, these devices on average weigh about 50 or 60 pounds. So um, just receiving a box at their home um, even though it's a simple box that just requires unboxing and setup, that may be uh, past their physical limitations or capabilities. So that is the actual installation assistance. Um, it does not require any um, licensed or experienced uh, uh, certification to put it together, I guess. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks so much, Josh. Yeah, thank you all for those very insightful questions. Um, I'm just uh, checking on time. Wanted to see if folks have any other questions about the climate services slide. I think we only have uh, one or two more to, to cover. Um, and with that, I will move to the next slide. And um, so last but not least, we have um, this last step where members can follow to create their uh, care plans and get help when needed. Um, we have here that care coordinators will check in with members every six months to see how things are going and if member um, members need other benefits, and I think um, maybe we can tweak this one a little bit as well, um, just so it's clear that <clears throat> members can uh, co-create this plan with um, their care coordinators um, once, not as a last step, but earlier in the process. So we'll, we'll do some thinking and we can adjust this slide accordingly. And then our very last slide is just um, a slide with uh, more information and helpful links for members to, to have and reference. And then that's our member journey tool. 
And I just want to thank everyone uh, for your time today and to allow us to go through this tool with you. I believe it's attached in your um, invite. So if you need more time to you know, take a look at the, the tool and share your feedback, um, we'll be looking forward to that. And I see more hands up. Leslie, please. Hi, sorry, I had missed my opportunity and then was waiting to the end, but I had a question on page seven around um, how do I know if I'm eligible and just in rereading the guidance document and these first three bullets on, on this member journey tool around if I'm younger than six, older than 65 or older or currently pregnant, but the guidance document is, you know, far more stringent there. It's not anyone that's pregnant. It's someone that's pregnant and has another risk factor. Right. So I'm just concerned that that's far more broad um, in this member tool than in the guidance. I can speak to that if that would be helpful. Of course. Um, thank you for raising this and, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to help clarify this a little bit. Part of our negotiation with CMS and our collaboration with CMS on this is that um, in order to get this services protocol approved through um, all of the various federal bodies, they wanted to make sure that we were um, linking these age and pregnancy related criteria with specific clinical conditions, because obviously as a Medicaid benefit, we are making the argument that these climate devices um, are promoting health and well-being. And so the language that we use is, um, as, as you know, is you know younger than six, 65 or older, currently pregnant, and has, has had, or is at risk for a collection, as you said, of um, clinical conditions. Simply having the physiology of being younger than six, 65 or older, or pregnant, puts everyone in those categories at least at risk for some of those clinical conditions. So this is a little bit of a um, complicating path, but ultimately the distillation is that um, anyone younger than six, 65 or older and currently pregnant is potentially at risk for those clinical conditions and thus looking for and needing to document those clinical conditions in those three categories is superfluous. I very much appreciate that that is um, that, my, that may be interpreted as an overcomplication. And as I mentioned, it was just part of the collaboration and negotiation with CMS to get this approved through all the federal agencies um, and with their support, how we could word that in a way that both recognizes that being younger than six puts you at greater risk for um, heat and weather related uh, morbidity and mortality, um, but linking it to the potential clinical risks or health risk conditions. Leslie, does that, I won't say totally clarify things, but help <laughs> the through line on why in this guidance, we are simplifying it to just those ages. I think I'm just concerned about members interpretation and, and also, I mean, also our interpretation of this as well. I mean, as we're, attempting to set up our logic for outreach and engagement and prioritization of these eligible members you know we we did a pretty sh sharp pivot right when the guidance was pretty clearly more stringent and um you know then, then there's the other issue about looking at the guidance versus looking at this and seeing two pretty different things um and then also that when you're looking at climate, for example, right, it's only specific climate devices, right? So I, I don't, I'm just worried about the interpretation um, from both a member and, I mean, and also a CCO perspective, you know, when we're attempting to identify these members, um, you know, we, we changed our logic and our inputs um, based off the new guidance, not based off of this being more broad. So I, I want to, you know, you mentioned the, the term prioritization, and I just want to acknowledge that that is um, going to be a slightly different dynamic, because if one needs to prioritize within all of these groups, 
um, there are clearly people who, because of their underlying health conditions or the intersection of their health conditions, their age, their race, where they live, their housing status, et cetera, et cetera, other life experiences, may be at particularly higher race, a uh, higher risk, excuse me. Um, and I think, you know, the, the issue is how does one, so the, the choice of the words at risk for really opens up to how do you determine who is at risk for things like child maltreatment, like heat exhaustion or heat stroke. Um, our predictive ability is, you know, is, is not super evidence-based for some of those things. And so that's the, the leeway and the openness that that at risk for um, allows. Uh, but to your point about prioritization, people who've had a history of heat exhaustion or ED utilization um, are certainly at higher risk. Jean was next. Oh, thank you, Jesse. Um, I wanted to go back to um, what Amelia was discussing about the the process for the care coordination and the um, the care plan, the service plan. Um, so before they get to a care coordinator, the the um, UM coordinator will be gathering, will be getting the information and determining eligibility. And at that point, they may, the UM coordinator may be the one that's contacting to verify the address, um, not just a care coordinator. I, I think for members particular, we might want to change the language or, or um, CCO staff. I, I'm not sure, um, but it may not be the care coordinator necessarily. And then that being said, I, I just want to know the process. Do they, so uh, when a UM coordinator and um, and when UM determines they're eligible, right? So then they will, um, we will then start to order the device, for example. Do, does the member need to meet with the care coordinator before the device is ordered? I didn't, I didn't know if that, I was a little confused because that wasn't in our process makeup, but now after Amelia talked, I was, I'm wondering if that has to happen. And if it does have to happen, when a member says, no, I don't want a service plan, no, I'm not going to sign, but they still, they still can get the device, um, then it would be the UM coordinator who's gathering and making sure that the address and everything is there because they don't want to meet with a care coordinator. I know I'm throwing a whole bunch of things here, but um, the process here makes it look um, is a little confusing. Hi, Sean. Thank you for that uh, feedback. I think I just use, uh, I will be the first to say I think that I do not know exactly how the process works internally for each CCO so maybe I'm not using the perfectly correct phrasing and referring to like the care coordination team um so like it, it is totally possible that yeah a member declines being a part of that planning doesn't want all of those things but yeah we, we've said in our processes that they can decline all of that and still as long as they're eligible for a device still receive a device they don't have to engage in um like actively provide this stuff to go into the person-centered service plan and all of that. So I think that what would be helpful for us is better capturing who the member might engage with at the CCO to confirm something like address so that they can still receive uh, the device. Um, the content here that was kind of, you know, based on my feedback, but I think this is exactly one of the reasons why we're bringing it all to you to say like, did I get it right? And very comfortable if I didn't <laughs> get it right and we can refine it to actually match what your processes um, look like. And so I think this is the perfect spot to provide that feedback. Um, and if you're comfortable kind of um, sharing more information, maybe in an email um, about what that process might look like for the member, I think we can better capture it um, in this in this journey or these these resources, because we, we do want it to be as accurate as possible so that, you know, 
the member has kind of a, a better expectation and then you all can also use it as a resource to share with with folks of how to how to walk through the process so yeah i might not have used the right term by specifically saying care coordination um, team okay so they don't have to have a plan before the device is delivered That's correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Robin. Yeah, thanks. Back to that path, the previous discussion where we're looking at the clinical criteria, and you have the list with the age and um, you know pregnancy. So I just want to clarify to make sure I'm correct. So if someone, if an individual is age six or younger, or you know. Um, pregnant or age 65 and older, I think it was. Um, so those, anyone in that group then is covered, is that correct? That would meet the criteria or do we, because I, I agree with the simplification right. in that, you know, their physiology would predispose them for being at risk. Correct. Okay. So that is a kind of a, a change from what was some of the language in the guidance document. So that might be good to kind of I think this is a lot clearer well, document. The, the guidance document will stay, oh. you know, presuming that CMS doesn't have further clarification to our services protocol, because the guidance document reflects our services protocol, but that's how you should interpret at risk for. Okay. Is that, I, I know I'm being really precise about that subtlety, um, but that's how the at risk for is interpreted. Simply being younger than six places you at higher risk for heat exhaustion, simply being 65 and older, et cetera. Okay, so even though it says, you know, age six and younger and at risk for these conditions, we can kind of, that, it sounds like that might be, just be for CMS's benefit. And so we can, is that correct? We can interpret it this way? Correct. Okay. Correct. Can you repeat yeah, where that was in, the, forbearance on it. in the documentation, the at risk for the specific language? Uh, that's in the HRSN guidance document. Um, that is in the climate device specific clinical risk factor table mm -hmm. on page eight in the version that was sent to CCOs on the 22nd of December. Is that where you were asking about? Thank you. I just didn't know if it was what I was already looking at or if there was somewhere else I should be finding that. Thank you. I appreciate it. And and so to summarize, so the confusion is why does this document not mirror verbatim what the guidance document contains, con causing confusion? The the short answer is it, it's it's not necessary to include that level of detail within this document for members. Meg, anything to add on to that? That is the the tightrope that we're walking on this one. And then also a reminder that the clinical, um, the risk factors may not be exhausted because we do allow latitude for um, for other specific um, clinical conditions. Um, we include that in the, the guidance document as well. Yeah, and Jesse, you're speaking to the option for review for medical exception, just like we have with all other health services yeah. that yeah. Um, these are the illustrative conditions that we that there is very solid evidence that places individuals at higher risk for morbidity and mortality in extreme weather. Um, and um, this is not an exhaustive list. There are other conditions, thyrotoxicosis, um, individuals that have recently had severe burns, um, it, it's that, you know, that may be taking other medications that puts them at risk for um, thermodysregulation. And so um, we want to be explicit that uh, please use your good medical judgment to um, determine if you have members who are at risk under these under conditions that are not listed. Thank you for specifying that, Jesse. Appreciate all the great questions and feedback on this. Um, 
If you have additional thoughts or feedback, please uh, let us know, send them via email. Um, we're gonna move on to the next topic for today. Um, we're a little bit over time, so I wanna make sure that we can start to discuss eligibility for HRSN housing services. So um, again, please feel free to reach out if you have specific feedback when you uh, are continuing to review that um, member journey. Okay, I think Callie Glenn Haley, you're up next. Thanks, Jesse. And Chelsea, I think we have some slides prepared on that original deck. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Callie Glenn Haley, she, her pronouns. I'm on the housing team for the 1115 waiver. Um, if anyone needs to get up and stretch and maybe blink your eyes a little bit because of all of the focus, um, I invite folks to do that. Um, and we're gonna dive into a little bit more specificity around the eligibility um, for the housing benefit and um, looking forward to feedback and areas where additional clarification um, is needed. So next slide, please. So um, this is the overarching HRSN eligibility framework. And I think it should be very um, uh, familiar to you all. And we kind of went over a version of it in the last session. But as you know, we have the covered populations um, plus a clinical risk factor, social risk factor, and then any specific um, eligibility for the specific service. So today I'm going to kind of dive in a little further specifically on the covered population for housing. Um, next slide. Um, so uh, just to zoom in on housing, um, and first off, just as a reminder, um, this is for, uh, for November 1st in particular. Um, additional populations will be phased in over time. So this is kind of just for November 1st. And I, I want folks to um, just keep that in mind. Um, so for our implementation date of November 1st, um, we are focusing on the at-risk population per HUD's definition. Um, this was communicated in a press release back in September. So hopefully you all had a chance to read that. Um, what we've added is kind of a further narrowing. So we've added that among the at-risk population, we're focusing for November 1st <laughs> on people who need support staying in um, or maintaining already, sorry, maintaining their current or already identified housing. And so this is a preventative approach to prevent people from become, becoming homeless. Um, and similar to other services, of course, there's a clinical, re, clinical factor component um, and then a couple of other uh, eligibility um, items. So for example, for utilities, you need to also be receiving rent. Um, so I'm gonna talk about OHA's rationale for that kind of narrowing of eligibility in a couple of slides. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this is the HUD definition, and I know this is a, a packed slide, but um, I wanted to put it all in because there's a lot of interpretation um, and a lot in there. And we actually <laughs> um, didn't even include two additional components. Um, that encompass people who are actually homeless. So um, a child or youth uh, that qualifies as homeless under different um, uh, statutes and regulations. So if you review this definition, you'll note that it encompasses people who are actually homeless um, in very unstable or unsafe living situations and they need to find a new place to live. Um, and it also encompasses people who need support maintaining their current or already identified housing. Um, and we've really, uh, we are really for this first phase focusing in on this population um, for a preventative approach. Uh, next slide, please. So our rationale for this, and I, I, I think it, um, yeah, there's uh, some, um, a lot to consider here. 
So our first um, kind of rationale was that uh, we know that statewide housing availability is an issue and we didn't want to tie um, the success of our um, waiver to housing availability um, if there are housing shortages. We know that Medicaid is an entitlement which kind of complicates um, how to provide this service in a environment where there's not necessarily housing availability. The second um, item is coordination with um, or integration with coordinated entry. Uh, as many of you know, the housing system through the housing continuum of care, um, there are eight in the state of Oregon, maintain a coordinated entry system which ranks individuals um, on by kind of vulnerability according to an assessment that varies slightly among each of the um, COCs. And this coordinated entry system um, allows for uh, individuals to be matched with housing as it becomes available, um, but kind of ranked by vulnerability in many ways. Um, for us to uh, work with individuals that need new places to live, we need to figure out a way to integrate or work with the coordinated entry system in a way that is equitable. Um, and given the tight timelines, um, we have more work to do um, in pursuing that. Um, the third item is follow-on funding. I don't think it will be a surprise to folks on the call. We've definitely gotten so much of this question, so many um, instances of this question that six months of rent uh, may not be sufficient to stabilize the housing of many individuals. And we need to um, further work on identifying um, how to blend funding, follow-on funding streams, and kind of better answers to the question, well, what comes after six months? So those items um, were, uh, are some of the feedback that we received, concerns that people had about um, the kind of the way that housing eligibility had been written in the STCs. Um, and so we want to focus on this preventative approach. Um, and the need is there. I'll also just note, <laughs> it's, it's funny, I zeroed in on our limitations, but of course there's also um, the, the um, the strength of this approach is that statewide, um, we are housing providers are housing homeless individuals, but the reason why it doesn't seem to really make a difference is because more individuals and families are becoming homeless than the amount being housed um, every year. And so the preventative approach makes sense. It also, um, once people become homeless, uh, they are at greater risk of uh, anything from you know their social experience as well as their health um, outcomes and preventing people from becoming homeless in the first place um, is a um, a more streamlined and efficient and humane approach. So there's that aspect as well. I'll also just note there's so much funding in the state for people who are homeless, and um, this preventative approach um, I think is a nice complement to that. So that's kind of our rationale um, for this November 1st um, uh, uh, um, date. And one thing that we've been, and I kind of have this discussion question, and I also see um, some items in the chat, which I will be able to review in just a moment. Um, so uh, one aspect, there's kind of two um, areas for eviction prevention. One is the more rapid style where uh, an individual or a family receives an eviction notice and they really have 10 days to repay or they risk going to court, which we would want to avoid. Um, knowing that there's been a lot of conversation with CCOs already about the length of time to authorize services. Um, we've talked about 14 days. Um, I wanted to feel out if there is a way to do this kind of this rapid style of eviction prevention, or if we should focus more on the longer term, um, for lack of a better 
better way of saying this kind of longer term eviction prevention where people um, may have lost a job or um, had an unexpected expense and they have a bit more flexibility than having already received an eviction notice. Um, so they have maybe a bit more flexibility and this would be a, um, a benefit that would kind of kick in at that point. So curious to hear your thoughts, recognizing that there's already been a lot of conversation about the 14 days, but wondering you know, what other options there might be. So that's um, one discussion question. And I'll also take a look at the chat. And um, you know, folks have other questions, happy to hear them. Um, and Deanne, that is what we are currently discussing. Um, so the question was, um, would we pay um, arrears? And um, we, um, where we're currently landing, and so I don't want to set it in stone, of course, quite yet, um, but uh, where we're currently landing is that it's kind of six months total. So if some of that is in arrears, um, that is, that's an acceptable use of this, this um, benefit. And sorry, um, Jean, could you say what CC is or co care coordination? Yeah. Okay. Th this is Jean. It's care oh, coordination. Jean, um, and we we have concerns if they don't, if a member, if they don't want a service plan. And we're, our, I think the goal is to get them stable and to have goals and and help them through this time where we're helping them financially, but there's a lot of other issues and conditions, right? So if they say, no, no, I wanna waive that, but I can still get this benefit. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, and I think, I think there's probably more discussion to be had on this point. Um, and Jesse, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. I think we've, um, discuss that we don't want the person-centered service plan to be a barrier to the services being provided. Um, and uh, there's typically housing CBOs also maintain their own housing plan or transition plan for the people that they work with. Um, and so I think there's kind of a evolving conversation that can happen between CCOs and the housing CBOs as to, um, you know, in the case that you mentioned where a member chooses not to participate, um, uh, would does that mean necessarily that they are also choosing to not participate with their housing CBOs kind of care process? Um, so I think that's probably an evolving conversation, but um, the premise that we don't want the service plan to be a barrier, I think still stands for this service. Does anyone have any thoughts on um, CCO's ability to work with individuals with an eviction notice to work that quickly? This is Lindsay from UHA. I can tell you from our flex process, we are um, having to do some urgent expedited housing requests due to eviction notices. Um, although they're given 10 days, a lot of times we don't get the request until it's just a couple days before the notice. So that then 10 days is still, um, while, while we try to achieve that, but um, a lot of times we do get that notice in that shorter turnaround time. So I would say it would really depend on how the payment function works and the volume increase of the requests when we get them also, right? So we can say like maybe with our current volume now that's reasonable, but as this is um, socialized more and becomes a benefit and maybe the volume increases, it would be harder to meet that turnaround time. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a lot of factors to consider in addition to, you know, the way if 
we're having to make payment now. A lot of times the, the housing, you know, the claim doesn't pay right away, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And so while we have 10 days, maybe we can make a decision in that time. That doesn't mean they'll necessarily get payment in that amount of time. So then it goes back to, you know, will that landlord take a promissory note or something like that? So there's a, a lot more that has to go into it, but from decision, from receiving it to the time payment is made within 10 days is really hard to do without a lot more coordination and hand delivering of checks and that kind of thing. Right. Thank you for that, Lindsay. Anna? I would just echo what, what Lindsay said um, with my experience with our flex fund and requests. We often get requests with an eviction notice, um, you know, in, in 72 hours, it will go into effect or in 24 hours or, it, you know, it's tomorrow. And um, we really struggle to be able to react and get payment out because there are, you know, the things that go along with paying uh, a, you know, a property management company or something. We need, you know, we need our finance department needs paperwork from them so that we can legally pay them money and they're not always willing to respond quickly or even get it to us sometimes depending on uh, the property owner and the, the actual living situation. Um, so I, I foresee many situations where we would not be able to do that. Um, less than 10 days and even 10 days sometimes is is challenging if we're trying to gather information you know we need to get it to our finance department by wednesday so they can get a check out by friday but if it's going by mail that may not be acceptable and then who hand delivers checks and you know across our you know two county area sometimes very rural like how how does that work and that's a lot of additional uh time and uh you know travel time even just for people to deliver things like that so that is really good feedback and information um maybe one uh, added nuance is the difference between the cco providing the check to the landlord versus um situations whereby members and i i have seen jenna your comment in the chat but um let's let's go with this alternative scenario, um, because we are working to, in HRSN, build up the relationship between CCOs and housing CBOs. Um, so maybe another situation would be where a member comes to the housing CBO um, for a kind of an urgent um, eviction prevention check. Um, and the CCO, the role would not be to issue payment themselves to the landlord, but rather authorize the CBO to do so. So it would just be the service authorization component, not the, um, uh, the issuing of payment. Yeah, Anna. I still think the issuing of payment is, is a concern, even, even if there is a CBO who can do that payment more quickly. Um, often, you know, if we don't get that request until, you know, the member has an eviction notice that starts tomorrow, there, we may not be able to, we, even authorizing it, you know, takes time and then getting payment um, takes time. And, and often at that point, landlords are not, sometimes not willing to accept payment, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, they, they don't, they don't want to to continue that landlord tenant relationship in some cases that we've seen and so it's it's challenging and and like jenna says it is an assumption that there's a a housing cbo that's capable of doing that in the region which there may not be mm -hmm. and so without this kind of more rapid style prevention um and i recognize we're almost at time but Without a more rapid style eviction prevention, um, I guess uh, the what are the costs of that? You know, um, do you for, do you see this as being a, um, a unmet need in your community? 
would you all be able to comment a bit on that? All right. Um, well, more discussion, certainly. Um, looking forward to engaging more on this. Um, and Jesse, I'll um, pass it back to you and, uh, and yeah, continue this conversation. And I'll also read the chats and, and make note of them. So thank you for providing it. Thank you, Callie. And thanks for all the questions and comments and chats. Just got a few minutes left. So we wanted to wrap up with some um, other items and next steps. Next slide, please. Um, so some things, uh, upcoming things you can expect. So next week, I think we shared this in our CCO office hours. Uh, CCOs will be receiving the final contract amendment for climate related supports, um, as well as the final HRSN guidance document. Um, Want to express appreci appreciation for all the feedback we've received on the guidance document um, from CCOs and, and the feedback we received through the office hours. Um, we've been going through that feedback and considering uh, how we can update the document and clarify. Uh, some of the areas that we even talked about today uh, in today's session. So really appreciate that feedback. I'm looking forward to getting you the next version of that um, next week, the final version of that for the climate related supports. Um, of course, uh, potentially without that data sharing authorization form as we will need to be following up on that conversation. Um, also next week, we'll be filing our permanent Oregon administrative rules related to the climate related supports. These were presented at the October 18th RAC. Um, and then wanted to update folks. Um, this is new information here. We will be filing a temporary Oregon administrative rule um, capturing the provider qualifications that we've been sharing um, through contract drafts and CCO uh, HRS and guidance document. Um, we did not file a permanent rule for those and present that back in the October rack. So we'll be filing a temporary um, OAR, but then we will be scheduling a rack to take place in early uh, quarter two for that rule. Um, so again, that is reflective of the requirements that we've been sharing in the guidance document and the contract and uh, through these work sessions. Um, our next HRSN work session will be on February 8th. And so just a little preview of the topics we want to cover. We'll dive deeper into housing as well as nutrition. We want to start talking about eligibility and service definitions. Um, so looking forward to that. Also want to let you know that we are going to be reaching out to CCOs individually to schedule some nutrition one-on-ones. We have some questions that we want to uh, discuss with each CCO to help our uh, planning and design. Um, and then also, uh, for a core evaluation design update. Um, Lisa Price, I don't know if you want to uh, jump in and, and give the details there. Lisa is on. Hey, Jesse, this is Lisa. I realized I misunderstood the slide earlier, and I understood this to mean we were going to give this update at the, at the um, next CCO work session. That's great. Yep. So do, we will be giving this. Do you want to just give a a preview of what that will include next session? Sure. Um, we've contracted with CORE, Providence CORE, to develop the evaluation design. And as a part of that work, um, they are getting feedback from interested party on that design. So they'll come and talk about that. <clears throat> I think actually we may want to follow up with an email out to everyone um, for how they can share their details and become a, a part of that structure. So more, more to follow up. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Lisa. All right, folks, well, we are at time. Thank you again for your participation and great discussion, and we will be in touch soon. Take care. <laughs>